My name is Thomas Kerner, I work for Cisco. Um, some of you may know me from the last decade when before I ran off into the broadcast video industry. Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, I spend too much of my time on standards committees in that space. That's not what I'm talking about today, but I'm going to give you a bit of an idea of what's going on with a protocol or a standard called Dash. What does it mean uh, in terms of changes in video distribution for the, the top systems? And then a glimpse into a new video codec called HEVC or H.265, which was ratified earlier this year and should, in theory, uh, change some of the ways the flows are behaving over the next uh, coming years. So there you go. So that's what I just said. Um, obviously, there are numerous uh, video services out there. Um, I mean, BBC iPlayer, Hulu, Netflix, HBO Go, Sky, Love Film, wherever you are in the world, there is a service. You may or may not be a customer of it, uh, but it is out there, and uh, there are many of these services that have been growing over the last few years. So, historically, um, over the last decade, shall we say, uh, systems were using very primitive ways of distributing the video. So, HTTP progressive download was the number one way. You had a big file that was the encode of your content uh, in a single bit rate, or you had maybe multiple of those versions which you selected when you started off. Uh, it was an ordinary um, HTTP download. Uh, it was in many formats, whatever the flavor of the day was from the, your distributor at that point in time for the content. And it became progressive, basically, um, at the point where you were able to also do uh, advanced so-called functionalities when HTTP 1 plus 1, uh, sorry, 1 by 1 was out there and you were able to search on a byte range where you wanted to access the content as opposed to having to restart that download from the beginning. So very primitive model. Uh, client does an HTTP GET pulls down uh, your file, you start playing it out, depending on if you've got DRM, not DRM, i.e. protection against the, uh, for the content. It was stored in memory, it was stored in different areas uh, to prevent you from potentially copying the content. So we've gone to a world which is slightly better from that, uh, which is the multi-bit rate encoding and representation shifting, uh, simply because we have mobile devices, we've got all sorts of underlying technologies for delivering the content, it being over um, DSL or Wi-Fi or uh, FTTH or whatever you might have. So in order to adapt the quality of experience or the user experience uh, to the device which you're targeting and to make sure that you didn't have too many um, drops, uh, we segmented these um, programs into multiple speeds uh, at bit rates and therefore depending on the available bandwidth at that point in time you would jump from one to the other. So as you can see on this diagram you would first of all have an initial request, you would receive what we call the manifest and we'll talk about the manifest uh, later because that is the core element to uh, MPEG dash. You would receive first of all at most likely the lowest bit rate then each client has its own secret source on how they do it so 200, 400, 800k and based on what speed you're receiving that data within a given amount of time, i.e. before you have a, uh, a buffer underrun, you would basically stick to that speed more or less. So you'd be able to have the highest video for the given bit rate. And therefore it tried also to clog uh, most of the bandwidth as we saw from the uh, previous speaker. There is some interesting things going on there and I also have a slide uh, further on. So you would therefore throttle based on the available bandwidth, especially if you're switching from one type of infrastructure to the other. So how does it look in the world of uh, distributing this content? First of all, you have a source, most likely a high-grade source, which is coming from you know, maybe a, a studio or um, a source from who you've licensed that content. We're talking about an ecosystem where we're, uh, the content has been licensed from uh, various licensees. Um, you will transcode it to all the different formats and different rates you want to support. So in the case of public numbers, I think Netflix announced they do about 120 different transcodes for all the endpoints they need to support, it being a connected TV, an Xbox, your mobile phone, a laptop, and so on. Uh, then you have to encapsulate it into all the different formats. In this case, we mean the Apple HLS uh, format, so the HTTP live streaming, or Microsoft um, Smooth Streaming, for example, which are two of the main contenders in that space. Uh, then you may or may not have encryption, depending on what you need to distribute and the right holders. Uh, then we can move into the world of CDNs. You have an origin server where you point the assets to, so the content. Uh, and then you have the usual CDN model of distribution towards the customer and you have a client which is going to do a number of HTTP gets to receive that content. So that's typical 101 uh, high level view of a, of a video workflow. Now, why do we need NPEG-DASH? Uh, XKCD can always say better than anyone else. 
Uh, we have a number of standards out there. As I said, we've got HLS uh, from Apple. They're going down their own path, and they update it every time there's a new iOS release, usually, adding some features in. So as you all know, it's an ITF draft. Uh, it gets updated when it needs to be. Uh, Microsoft uh, Smooth Streaming is, as I said, another approach. Uh, and then there's a reason of saying, well, all these competing standards, where do we go? We need some rationalization, not only about the payload itself, but actually how we manage all these assets and what's the front end. So that's the goal behind MPEG Dash. So MPEG Dash is not a new codec. It's using existing audio and video codecs. It's basically a so-called enabler uh, to allow the different formats to enable uh, high quality streaming over the internet. What it does, for those who are not too familiar with MPEG, is we define models at a very high um, level and then different uh, organizations and standard bodies will pick up that work and will do their own, uh, basically drill down on what's available in the specification to bring it down to a European level, a national level, and so on. So it's a very hierarchical model. Um, it's using HTTP for the time being. Uh, maybe it might use something else in the future, but again, due to the world of firewalls and NATs, uh, it is still using HTTP for the time being. Uh, so we standardize a container, and as I said, that's what I'm going to be talking about afterwards. DRM is not specific, so digital rights management. How do you actually protect the content or for what time that content can be accessed is within the framework, but we're not saying you can use DRM X, Y, or Z. That can be defined in some of the national bodies or some of the others, but not at the MPEG level. So we basically take these uh, adaptive streams, uh, we switch them in the hierarchical model, and that again is the MPD, which I'll be talking about afterwards. There are extra bits such as captioning, which now is mandatory, for example, in the US, there's something called the uh, CALM Act, which requires that um, YouTube and everybody else who does streaming provides subtitles for their content, and that was actually went into force on uh, March 30th. So now every single piece of content that's available in North America should have, uh, for accessibility reasons, um, subtitles. Uh, there is the same sort of trend going on in Europe. Uh, and there is also support for what we call trick modes, i.e. you've got a you know, sort of PVR functionality where you can fast forward, rewind, pause, and so on. So that had to be supported within the framework. So in green, we have here what are the parts that we talk about. So MPD, which I've used as an acronym quite a lot, and I'll be specifying afterwards. And this is the core of what Dash is really about. As I said, it's not a whole system around it. It's really about defining a standardized process. Again, on the Dash client side, uh, whoever the <coughs> provider of the client happens to be can continue doing all his secret source and the way he was doing it right now. So Microsoft is happy and uh, others are also happy about how they run the, the back end, the control engines, the media engines. So what are the codecs, what are the optimizations, software, hardware, what platform and so on. And the HTTP client itself with whatever optimizations they put in there. The only thing they standardized on the client side is the parse of that MPD, so the manifest, um, and how you handle the segments that are being sent down. So this is an MPD, it's a terrible picture, but uh, anyway, it's a picture nevertheless and easier to explain than bullet points, of course. We have the media presentation on the left, uh, which is basically defining a period, and that period can be the whole length of a film or a clip, or it can be segmented into multiple um, uh, components. Then each period itself will have a pointer to a set of URLs, so basically we've got a hierarchy here, with the adaptation sets, meaning what are the audio and video um, codecs that are going to be used, or subtitles, which tracks can be used. So most people think of it in a linear model, where I'm going to have what? I'm going to have one audio and one video, but now we have more multi-track uh, audio, multi-language, audio description again, which is uh, helping uh, some, uh, s some target user groups to be able to have access to content because they've got um, hearing impairments and so on. Uh, you also have selection, maybe you want a, you know, a commentary, a director's commentary on a piece of content. Uh, if you're a channel like you know, Euronews where you broadcast in eight different languages, uh, you will want your user to be able to select which of those eight audios he needs to listen to and not send down all the eight audios to the end user while retaining one single video uh, presentation. Or you can also jump in and jump out uh, of different you know, viewing angles and so on. Then below that level, we have, of course, the, the, the meat of it, which is the representation of the bandwidth that is needed. You know, am I on a very constrained link? Do I have a lot of bandwidth? Uh, what is the resolution I want to send it at? Uh, what is the uh, uh, capabilities of the client device in terms of uh, in decoding video capabilities and audio capabilities? So you have this hierarchy of representations. Segment duration is also defined. Uh, some people like to build small segments to cross some of these networks. Uh, some of them are as large as 10 seconds. Uh, that also uh, impacts the t your user experience, how long it takes before you start uh, decoding and displaying video. 
And then at the bottom, you have basically uh, the um, URL to actually go to those media segments themselves. So the actual blocks that you'll be sending down the line to the user, to the client. So as you can see, it's a, it's a hierarchical model. And this really is the core of the so-called MPEG dash specification. So another terrible slide, and it's intentional. Um, <laughs> Yes, actually, I didn't change the colors. I left it the way it was. Um, we have basically in Dash two large camps. And the first camp is around uh, the traditional way that uh, linear, so your normal uh, TV broadcast programs are delivered using what we call the MPEG-2 transport stream. So for those who don't know, we basically break down, um, in the case of video, into a group of pictures. So we stack them together. There's a reference keyframe. There's a number of subsequent frames, and we go on. At the same time, we also have the same with uh, audio, encoded in, um, in its own codec, and then transported in the transport stream. That's the legacy from your digital TV. And for my sins, I'm actually the editor of that specification for Europe. Um, so you can put some of the blame on me. Uh, the uh, HLS model, so is uh, the Apple model, is using the MPEG-2 transport stream. <laughs> Apple decided to go down that route, and they break down the MPEG-2 transport stream into their segments, their chunks. And as part of the specification, they also built this, this profile model where we have a MPEG-2 TS simple, where they've reduced the numbers of functionalities compared to what you'd have in a normal transport stream. So the idea here was take any on-air TV show that is being broadcasted, that has been broadcasted, so it goes to a set-top box, a connected TV, or what you want, um, and you could actually use that as the source content for building your uh, Dash stream. On the left side of this slide, we have another container called the ISO-based media file, which is basically also known as the MPEG-4 container. Um, and in this case, it's not MPEG-4 as in the uh, video codec, but it's uh, MPEG-4 part whatever, which defines the specification. Um, and it is being used by the likes of um, Microsoft with the smooth streaming. And you have two different profiles that live in there. One of them is the live profile, and it's actually not directly related to uh, live broadcast TV, for example, but I will not dwell into that level of details. Um, and then you have the on-demand, which is used by um, a standard known as Ultraviolet, for example, which is an upcoming standard for selling you not only a DVD and a Blu-ray, but also a code to go and download the digital version of the, of the film you just bought. So, high level, you got this framework, and now what do we do with it? Because the greatest thing about all this stuff is it needs to be interoperable. So the pain here is how do we get a number of players in the industry to make sure that they all wrote the spec in the same way, they're all reading the spec in the same way, and it actually works between different clients. So this is where Dash 264 comes into play. So once the standard was designed, or during the process was designed, a number of the uh, key stakeholders in that process defined uh, the Dash Industry Forum. And their goal is obviously the, a marketing uh, tool to promote the use of MPEG Dash, since they all have some form of interest in delivering MPEG Dash. Uh, but also, the point is to define the interoperability points. So what systems we need to test at what rates, i.e. what codecs, uh, in this case, obviously, H.264, um, but also at what rates, um, on what devices, with what clients, and so on. And this is key for actually Dash to succeed, because just having a nice big spec that everyone's going to try and implement works with trial and error and a lot of debugging, but here it's actually to try and get a number of uh, the key stakeholders to actually do testing. And you've got open source versions of this. There's a couple of f uh, free libraries that exist out there. There's academic research that's been done that are promoting some of that work. There are vendors such as the one I represent who are doing work in that space and many others. So we break it down to the specific values and features that are required out of the MPEG Dash framework for this work, the codecs that are needed to be supported. Uh, because there's a whole group, you can do everything from uh, Dolby True HD, which is uncompressed uh, audio at very high bit rate, uh, to very compressed audio as you would use it in a video conferencing system. You need to support some type of subtitles and captioning. You've got regulations, as I said, North America, Europe, and so on. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that it's not always interoperable or compatible. So you need to make sure that the systems you're building will be able to work with the different modes. Uh, DRM specifics, you know, which of those DRM solutions that are out there need to be supported in which way. Uh, transport layer specifics, so again, how are we going to actually do the, uh, the encode and the transport of this. And the metadata, because there's always metadata. One thing you discover in the broadcast industry is that your asset without any metadata is worth nothing. <coughs> so you need loads of metadata, and actually there could be loads more. So this is basically a short description of what those profiles happen to be. So they were actually restricted it only to using the MPEG-4 uh, file format container, with the live and the on-demand profiles, and none of the MPEG-2 transport stream 
uh, as defined and as used in some might call it the legacy uh, world of, uh, of live broadcasting. Um, encoding wise, uh, they're using the H.264 AVC, also known as MPEG-4 um, video codec. Uh, I'll spare you details because there's different what we call profiles and levels and that includes what functionalities can be used for encoding and decoding. Um, and there is a main profile layer th uh, level 3 and a main profile layer level 3.1 and that defines what you're doing for your encode in, in SD and HD for both of them. Um, audio, they made it simple, they kept one codec, which is nice. Uh, so they're using high efficiency um, advanced audio coding uh, version 2, which most of you are already familiar with because most of your audio library is most likely using that since you've most likely also migrated from, uh, <coughs> from MP3s. Uh, there's no muxing of the audio video. Um, and I'll spare you the bit about the uh, group of pictures, uh, but there is models where you can have what we call a closed and open group of pictures and there's switching functionalities, but now we're dwelling again into a level of uh, video specific details which are not required. Uh, the tricky one again is the subtitles. As I said, there are different efforts going on. North America's got what we call the SEMTTT, time text. Uh, the European Broadcasting Union, who um, helps most of the European broadcasters uh, with specifying recommendations, they're not formal standards, uh, have their own specification, uh, and then there are others. And the idea now is to come up with a superset of this, which was derived from W3C, uh, to actually allow everyone to interrupt worldwide and not have, yet again, three different specifications for three different parts of the world, especially when you're going to be streaming content from a US network into a European client, which of the different time text profiles you need to support for your subtitles and so on. Uh, DRM is using uh, something that is known as uh, common encryption, which is a framework again, and that could be an entire discussion on its own, but I uh, won't go there. So, um, uh, Dave uh, stole a bit of my thunder because I was hoping to do a bit on uh, buffer bloat in the context of Dash, but he already put up slides on it, so uh, no worries there. Um, one of the things we wanted to figure out was what, uh, what's the impact of Dash on, again, uh, smaller flows such as voice over IP? Uh, do they get trashed? Uh, here he gave the answer. So there's some testing done by in Georgia Tech, um, uh, and this is a slide I stole from one of his presentations, uh, with credit, of course, uh, about studying this issue, uh, understanding how those MPEG Dash flows are dwarfing uh, the rest of the traffic. And yes, there is a problem. And as I said, they've already uh, alluded to that uh, previously or hammered in, depending on how you look at it. Um, and there is need to, uh, uh, to get uh, this, um, um, you know, the work that Dave and others are doing uh, into the frameworks for supporting uh, also the MPEG Dash. Uh, I agree also that it'd be nice if Dash was nicer in terms of how it handled the bandwidth. Uh, unfortunately, the people who design it also want their application to be number one at the top of the food chain, like everyone else wants theirs to be at the top of the food chain. So it's nice to know that there's work that will be able to try and even this out. How am I doing on time? Um, okay, so that was the first part on Dash. It was a 101 on Dash, uh, trying to get people to understand what the issues are at stake here and why there's a need to get um, Apple and Microsoft uh, to uh, come through uh, common grounds. It doesn't mean everyone's going to implement it. Um, there is a lot of interest specifically in the mobile market in new applications, connected TVs. Um, but there's another major trendsetter that's going on in this space, uh, which may or may not be of direct interest to some of you, but I know is uh, for others. And that is a new codec that's being defined called H.265. Now that it's been ratified or HEVC for high efficiency video coding. Now, why do we need a new codec? Well, first of all, because we get bored. Uh, number two, because every 10 years, there's a leap in technology that allows you to improve on video compression. So you're all familiar with MPEG-2, um, which some of you also will know as H.262, which is the basis of all your legacy uh, digital t uh, TV, so digital terrestrial or DVD, for example. Uh, it's been out for now uh, you know, a very long time, nearly 20 years. Uh, and is basically the underlying of all broadcast, digital broadcast uh, around the world. There was an, eff an effort to improve upon that with MPEG-4 Part 2, uh, which is uh, loosely, and I'm using the term loosely because anyone who's into uh, video coding would, would um, trash me for that, but closer to being DivX than anything else in terms of technology. And then uh, in 2003, we uh, defined uh, advanced video coding, so H.264, so known as MPEG-4 Part 10, that's where the confusing thing comes with all these different parts in MPEG-4 <laughs> and other standards. Uh, and that's the basis of all your high definition um, services today or most of your mobile content. Uh, anyone who's uh, doing a modern uh, stream uh, solution today is using H.264 because the compression is basically a ratio of 2 to 1 versus what we're doing with MPEG-2. So for the same perceived video quality, half the bandwidth. 
And 2013, after about five years of work, uh, we ratified at the end of January at the MPEG meeting uh, the new standard, which is known as high efficiency video coding, so the HEVC bit. Uh, has also an ITU uh, number for it, which is H265. And it also has an MPEG name, which is MPEG H part two. So all those three acronyms are interchangeable. It's the same spec ratified by different bodies. So it's always a joint effort and a joint set of policies and politics in different groups to try and agree upon this. Um, can be quite fascinating if you're into uh, two week long meetings in um, uh, basements uh, with basically um, you know, 12 to 14 hour days uh, non-stop reviewing people's proposals for including video coding tools. And we make a living out of it. Okay, so uh, HEVC, what are the main drivers? Again, the only reason you want to improve is because you can lower the bit rates. Okay, so again, the target is to have half the bit rate for the same perceived quality. So all we're trying to do is cheat your eyeballs. Okay, so your so-called human vision system, it's all about how much can we get away with that your brain will still think it looks the same whilst we're actually using less bits. So we're improving the coding efficiency, obviously. And as I said, the target again is the same two to one. Um, one of the main drivers is for those who do DSL deployments, there is still a part of your footprint you can't reach. Maybe you can with standard def but not high def services. So many of the DSL providers worldwide are very interested in this because it allows them to expand their footprint and reach customers they couldn't so far. Uh, the other area is also mobile services. Um, okay, we've got LTE coming up, lots of bandwidth to start off, but then customers will migrate, people use more and more services, they want higher quality, they've got better phones, better tablets, so on, they want better picture quality. So all that's gonna gobble up bandwidth, and therefore we need to be efficient from day one on delivering the uh, services over those platforms. There is something called uh, ultra high definition that's coming around, and if you sort of read you know, mainstream uh, uh, newspapers these days, it's starting to be mentioned in one way or another. There's two different uh, s um, standards in that space that are being worked on. This is so-called phase one and phase two. So there's a 4K, which is quad HD, which is four times the resolution of your standard HD today. And then there's the 8K, which is 16 times the resolution of your existing uh, HD service. And a lot more bandwidth on the back end to go and produce that content and many other uh, issues. There's also going to be a change in frame rates. We'll maybe have higher frame rates. We'll have wider color gamuts story for uh, over beer or another two hour discussion. Now, those, this codec will natively support those resolutions, which means it's got optimizations for it. Um, as I said, we want to improve the performance on mobile devices, trying to get closer to the HD capabilities. Um, there's also tweaking done in the chipsets to improve the power consumption, as in reduce it uh, for the more complex decoding. Uh, some uh, VOD, uh, providers, so over the top VOD, uh, whoever they may be, want to compete against what we call package media, i.e. Blu-ray, <coughs> um, because most of the services are done in 720p or 1080i, which are the regular HD formats. Um, and the last one, which is quite important, is yes, it is 10 times more complex to encode than you would have with H.264 or AVC, but it's only two to three times more complex to decode. So those who remember 10 years ago when H.264 ABC was released, you could not do a software decode. You needed your whatever GPU card to do the work for you. Then chips improved and we were able to do software decodes and you can today, no problem. Now the interesting thing is today, uh, or uh, actually a year and a half ago, you could do a software decode real time of an HEVC stream, which means that even if chips don't support today HEVC and will take another you know, 12, 18, 24 months to get into your devices, you could already have a software-based client that can do the decode. And there was some testing done with reference software. All these um, standards define reference software uh, as part of the process. And it only took about a 20% hit in terms of battery drainage uh, versus doing native uh, H.264 uh, decode. So that means that services will start getting deployed over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, this is to give you all a headache. Um, what the di main differences are in terms of video coding between AVC and HEVC is the fact that we have more flexibility. We have different um, coding unit sizes, which give you more flexibility the way you encode. Uh, we actually have better tree partitioning, which also <laughs> means that you have more flexibility to, in to encode different parts within the picture itself. Uh, we have more motion, motion vectors. We can go into more uh, directions for predicting where the content will be or where the movement of the content will be actually, and so on. So again, this is just a high level and people have specific questions can always come to me afterwards. 
So just to say that this is not uh, totally flawed, uh, we always use subjective testing. This is the only real metric uh, to um, be able to test. You know, we need to cheat the eyeballs. You can build all the technical systems you want, all the quality of experience models you want. It all works, but you need to baseline it to get su subjective testing so people understand what on earth it looks like and what the correlation points are between your um, computer-based system that's doing the, the measurements and your own eyes. And as you can see, roughly on the scale, uh, we have um, a two to one uh, representation in terms of bandwidth at the bottom versus the same perceived score. So it actually works. Of course, it is scene dependent, content dependent, it is frame rate dependent, and so on. But this is just one of the numerous <laughs> test sequences that we use uh, for this work. So what happens next? We've got these two systems, you know, a new video codec coming up, and we've got um, the, um, the Dash framework that's kicking in to unify all these uh, different, co um, different um, adaptive bit rate systems. Well, basically, we're at the beginning, okay? So 20 years ago, more or less, we had the MPEG-2 transport stream specification. It got widespread in the late 1990s with the digital TV services and the first people that moved over to that and DVD, of course. Uh, iPads were only launched in uh, April 2010, but by 2012 they had already high resolution, so the first retina displays on the iPads, higher than high resolution on your TV. Uh, MPEG Dash got finished uh, mid-2012, more or less. Uh, it is currently uh, H.264 AVC based, but of course work is being done to include the new codec, which means that more or less within the next two years we'll be hitting your TV, but more to the point your networks, a whole a uh, slew of new services which are based around the Dash framework uh, and this new codec. So the good news, we're reducing the bandwidth per flow, okay? But on the other hand, we're going to increase the fact that since we've improved the video compression, every single packet is more important. So customers will be even more, um, let's say, regarding upon the quality of the delivery. So I don't know where you're scoring the different indexes of how good your network is with regards to delivery, but you need to start planning whatever tools you need uh, to be able to figure out if you want to carry that traffic or not, and how you want to carry that traffic uh, across your networks. And I try to stay as much as I could in time. I think I am, Keith. So I'm open to a slew of questions or not. We have time for one question. <laughs> <laughs> Make it a good one. Thank you, Thomas. Who's first? Okay, I'll scare you to death, or you'll want to go and listen to Patrick. Uh, oh, uh, Dave. Sitting right behind you. Uh, hello. Uh, David Friedman from Clarinet. Just uh, following up on your, on your last point about the, uh, the delivery um, and customer sensitivity, uh, have you got any recommendations to operators as, as to how this can be measured and managed? Um, yes, but it's not something I can do in either five minutes or 20 minutes talk. It's got, there are so many implications on how your client is built, how your delivery is done, what codecs you're using, type of infrastructure. Um, but yes, there are a number of, uh, of ways to try and understand or recreate the type of uh, experience your customer has in the home and how to measure that, either in your head end or directly at your DSLAM or even having uh, different robots sitting around your network trying to, trying to look into that. So it exists. Uh, there are, as I said, numerous, pap <laughs> uh, numerous products, papers uh, that are published around that and there are actually entire conferences just on the quality of experience work. But I'm happy to follow up with you offline or a topic for another presentation. I think that would make a good follow-up presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. You're welcome.